So you're at the convergence, um, the forest and climate convergence, uh, 2019. Uh, overall, what brings you here? Um, I guess uh, this is actually going to be my first time uh, coming out. I've been um, secluding myself uh, from the whole Standing Rock thingy, and I felt like maybe now was a good time to uh, to uh, come out and maybe share some stories and get some input and say some input. And so mm -hmm. that's, that's, re that's the reason why I'm here. So the Standing Rock thing that you refer to, what do you, what do you mean by that? Standing Rock, well, um, I was in Standing Rock for almost like six and a half months. Hmm. And um, I had uh, caught two cases um, on October 27th of 2016. Um, during the North Ray camp, when all that stuff was going down and Kyle Thompson came barreling through, headed towards uh, Ochete uh, camp, um, I'm the guy that disarmed him. Um, he came, he was pointing an assault rifle at innocent women, children, and men while trying to barrel his way to camp. Who was doing this? This guy, his name is Kyle Thompson. He was working for Light and Security. He was uh, a part of uh, Tiger Swan, Knights and Bridge, working for all these entities. He was uh, oil pipeline security. So, Do you consider it an occupation? What do you, how would you describe what happened at Standing Rock? Is it a protest, occupation, resistance? How would you describe what happened there? Um, I guess I would... Uh, Probably, I'm leaning more for um, standing up for what is morally right. Okay, so how how far into that process of standing up did this incident occur with this? Um, so I believe that the whole thing started in maybe mid June, July, mm -hmm. and this was probably going towards the middle of the thing where things started to get uh, escalated. It started to get uh, escalated by. Um, Pipeline Security, um, Morton County, um, National Guard, and um, this was around the time where um, North Camp was getting raided and the camps were getting pushed back. <clears throat> and um, there were some heavy equipment um, that got torched mm -hmm. and the one person that was there around the heavy equipment um, was the guy Kyle Thompson mm. and um, I believe that uh, uh, he may have started the the uh, the fires to the heavy equipment uh, knowing that the people that were there at camp would get put the blame on so he came into camp with an assault rifle oh you know, he was barreling to camp he he got busted where the uh, heavy equipment was at mm -hmm. and um, he was getting confronted by, by some elders and the elders that confronted him noticed an assault rifle oh. on the passenger side of his vehicle. And so the guy was trying to uh, play himself off as, uh, as one of the people that was camped at camp. Mm. And so as the elder confronted him, letting him know, well, you do know that the camp is drug-free, alcohol-free, a weapons-free camp. And he went in to go and confiscate the uh, assault rifle and the guy just took off almost running over the uh, the elder that was doing so. And so um, <clears throat> the guy tried, uh, there was no other way that he could go. He couldn't go north because National Guard and you know the police were coming in. And so the only way that he was able to go was south towards Cannonball. And uh, 
he was met with uh, a bunch of people on the bridge and uh, some guy had uh, ran him off the road because they were getting calls on the radio saying that this guy had uh, an assault rifle. Mm. And so I didn't know nothing of this because I was taking people back to camp to the medic tent to get seen. And then while I was coming back over the hill onto the backwater bridge is when I seen uh, people trying to stop me and they're like, hey man, there's a guy in the gun or a guy with a gun in the water. And so when I exited my vehicle, I seen this guy with an assault rifle pointing it at people. And the only thing that uh, came to mind and the only reaction I did was to go and confront this person so that way he doesn't hurt other people. And um, in doing so, um, the oil pipeline security dude was like, you know, just, just let me go. Um, I just want to get out of here. I was like, I, I can't let you do that. Um, first of all, you, you have an assault rifle and you got, you know, two thirty round magazines in your cargo pants. So like, who knows what you're going to do? And, you know, with, with this state of mind going, going right now, and besides, you know, BI of Indian Affairs is coming over the hill right now, and how's that gonna look good on you? So I think you should just uh, hand over the rifle and I can guarantee you that nothing's gonna happen to you. And, um, you know, he insisted that uh, he, he'll keep the assault rifle and that uh, I should still let him go. And by this time, Bureau, Bureau of Indian Affairs had came, had uh, all their guns drawn, and they made their way to the river and I let them take over. Um, first, we got them to uh, unload the, uh, the bullet that was in the chamber, took out his magazine, and then uh, he gave it to the uh, Bureau of Indian Affairs. So that was like a little bit of a relief, right? So then like 24 hours later, come to find out, um, Bureau of Indian Affairs handed it over to the FBI and the U.S. Marshals and they gave him back his assault rifle and they let him go on his way. Hmm. And then a month later I found out that um, I was uh, Morin County's most wanted and I was being charged with the uh, Class C felony for uh, terrorizing the guy with the gun. Oh. Um, okay, uh, that's a very interesting and shocking story. So where this actually happened, so you said the Bureau of, in, it's, it's interesting <clears throat> to me. So was this uh, tribal property that he was on? Or well, what it, was was the on, it was on treaty property. Okay, but what does that mean, treaty property? I, I guess uh, I, I too ain't familiar with it uh -huh. because I'm from New Mexico where, right. you know, we're, we're different from the people of North. Right. Yeah. So the only treaties I know of is the Treaty of Hidalgo, mm -hmm. which, uh, you know, with the, with the Spaniards and stuff mm -hmm. like that. But I guess the, I think it was the uh, Laramie Treaty of Harbor, whatever year that was, but uh, that was all supposed to be um, land for the uh, Lakota and Dakota people. Mm -hmm. And for years, um, that treaty had been, you know, brushed off and not really been, um, how do you call it? Well, how would you say it? Um, recognized? Yeah, yeah, there you go. It was never really recognized. Otherwise, you know, all that wouldn't have been happening. And so, um, so it being on the easement of the Army Corps lands, um, Bureau of Indian Affairs could only come in so far. So you were charged uh, by whom, the, the federal? I, I was charged with Martin County. I was charged by Martin County. Uh, now, why do you think they did that? Um, honestly, I, I really think they charged me with that to, to make, um, to make an, an example out of me so people wouldn't stand up um, for what is morally right. Because there was a lot of people there who had their cameras out and was recording all the things that was happening. 
and um, it turned out that the guy that I escalated the situation with, his girlfriend um, at the time wasn't really feeling it and wanted to do a tell all thing. He started saying, you know, a lot of things, and so in return. The guy that I escalated a situation with came out and said, "You know, well, I believe I would have done the same thing." And right then and there, uh, his credibility uh, just went down the drain. And they, in July 2017, they um, they dropped my charges. So those charges were dropped. Yeah, and those charges were dropped. But then they threw. Uh, then I was getting charged federally. So I got charged with a federal civil disorder and then a federal use of a fire to commit a federal crime. So this was all surrounding that incident with, mm -hmm. the, with the individual with the assault weapon? Yeah. There were a lot of people who were concerned that this gentleman was going to do, do harm mm -hmm. to others, right? Yeah, there, the, a lot of, the main concern was is that this guy was sent in by the opposing side mm -hmm. to start shooting so that way you know, I guess the proper authorities mm -hmm. would be able to come in, guns drawn, and dismantle the whole camp. Mm -hmm. But that didn't happen mm -hmm. because nobody at camp was armed mm -hmm. except for the people they were trying to send in. Did you feel like you were coming to aid, that everyone was really trying to seek to resolve the situation, that there was a, 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 a threat that was happening then, and if someone didn't take action, there's a possibility someone could have been injured? Yes, of course. Right. <clears throat> and um, but no charges were filed against this gentleman. Or no anything. charges whatsoever. Okay. Um, so you were at Standing Rock a long time. Um, tell us a little bit about Standing Rock. Well, it was uh, when I first went to Standing Rock. Um, my son was in high school in Denver. I was living in Denver at the time, and uh, his. His teacher was from uh, the res uh, Sandy Rock Reservation, and you know, in a science class, they were talking about what would happen if this pipeline broke and the damage that it would cause on the Missouri River, on the land, and to the people, you know, the millions of people down river is going to affect. And so, um, you know, they're out in Denver, you know, spreading, spreading the news of what could happen, what would happen. And um, while all that was going on, uh, they were collecting donations. And uh, me, I, I'm a builder. I, I just build and uh, I got volunteered to go to um, Standing Rock to deliver these um, donations. And because uh, like, and I've never protested anything in my life before. And like, I really didn't even go up there to go do that either. When I got up there, like, like 15 minutes of arriving and setting camp up, uh, we caught a, a prayer march up to the spot where they bulldoze the um, sacred sites. Hmm. Like 15 minutes of getting there, um, I witnessed the oil, oil pipeline company bulldozing an archaeological site that they, you know, from what I've heard is that the state archaeologists and the tribal archaeologists were supposed to meet up there after Labor Day weekend and uh, talk about, you know, what easement this was and what easement that was and where all the archaeological sites were. So if the archaeologists were not to find anything there, then the pipeline was would have had the okay to go, you know. But these people went and uh, purposely disturbed all the archaeological sites, and that's when um, the security people started unleashing attack dogs. Mm. And I witnessed all that, and then I also witnessed uh, highway patrolmen from North Dakota and Martin County just watching all this go down, you know, standing there smoking a cigarette. And so like after that, like I was supposed to be there just that weekend, Labor Day weekend, and I couldn't find myself leaving knowing what I just witnessed. And, you know, I could have done something. 
and I and I and I and I just left. You know that wouldn't sit well with me. So you had no history as an activist. You had never protested anything before, is what mm -hmm. you're saying, and you were going there to deliver some yeah, supplies, supplies and, and you, you, you saw destruction of archaeological sites, you saw uh, some authorities just standing by while it looked like police over response mm -hmm. and abuse and you ended up staying. How long did you end up staying? Uh, six and a half months. Wow. So how, six and a half months, um, what was the most interesting thing you saw there in the six and a half months? Um, there was a lot of things that, I, that mm -hmm. I seen that, you know, I normally wouldn't see, you know, the whole camp itself. Yeah, it was like the biggest little city that just sprung overnight, you know, and um, how, how people were just uh, out there helping each other, making sure... Uh, Everyone was well taken care of. And that was the biggest thing is that I, I, I've noticed that I, I really like that because you don't see that anymore. You, know, you don't ever see anybody, you know, just looking out for their neighbor or anybody in general. And um, uh, of course the uh, Aurora Borealis, that was something to see, you know. And um, just how, um, the thing that caught my eye that, you know, was amazing to me, but wasn't really something that I really wanted to see, was how it looked like a war zone in our own country. Mm -hmm. You know, people standing up for what is right, but then on the opposing team, we got National Guardsmen, we got Morton County, we got Highway Patrolmen from all over the United States there, pointing guns at peaceful, you know, water protectors. That, so that's something that, you know, that's like, in my eyes, it was a, it's a really powerful statement, but at the same time, it's a really sad statement because not only were we there to uh, protect the water for the native tribes in that region, but for all the other people, all the other millions of people downriver on the Missouri River, how it goes right down mm -hmm. through here too. And, um, you know, to see all the people come together and um, stand up for that whole cause of having clean water and only to be met with guns mm -hmm. and like, like there's a lot of things there. Like they even had surface to air missiles there. Like, like we really had aircraft that were gonna come and do something, you know? And like they had all these, they had all these military lights up on the whole ridge. They put barbed wire, razor wire all along the side of Turtle Mountain. You know, I remember one time waking up and I did my morning prayer and I, and I seen a deer like right where they had the razor wires because they had like two rows of razor wires. And the deer was just only trying to get across and go seek refuge somewhere else, but, um, but it was stuck. Hmm. It had gotten caught up in some razor wire and um, we made our way over there. And uh, we had also seen other blood trails on the snow which indicated that there were other deer there that yeah. was trying to seek refuge somewhere else, and you know that that kind of really uh, that kind of really hit hard because like these animals, just like you know our children and our future children, they don't they don't choose to be brought into this world, and then to have to face you know contaminated water, contaminated land, and our air, like, I don't know, it's just really, it's just really hard. So you, you talk about morning prayers, you talked about prayer when you got there. Is there a spiritual element to this for you? Um, yeah, like, for the, for the longest time, uh, I, I grew up traditional in my, in my traditional uh, values where I was brought up in New Mexico. I'm, a, I'm Pueblo from San Felipe Pueblo. 
It's located right in the uh, middle of uh, New Mexico, in between Albuquerque and Santa Fe. And uh, growing up there, I was taught to be prayerful and to be mindful and to be a humble person. And, you know, wherever, we're, wherever we go, you know, we are told to keep in mind that our spirits, our entities, our creator, you know, goes with us everywhere. And so I, I practice that to this day to ask for guidance, you know, to ask for clarity, to um, ask that whatever is bothering me or hurting me to, you know, take that all away so I can continue into this life and, you know, do good. So you went there, you wanted to stand up for what was right, you want to do good there for six months, saw a lot, were involved in that horrible situation with the assault weapon, and then and you had charges filed against you for, for trying to, to help protect people. Was it worth it? <clears throat> I asked myself that, and I've had many people ask me that. You know, I, I believe the Creator puts us on a path for a reason. And if this was the reason he chose me to be on this path, I am okay with it. And I would probably do it again. Because whether, whether I get charged with, you know, when, when they decide to give me a court date and I get charged and uh, everything's all over and done with and if I'm sitting in the cell, you know, this is going to go down in the books. As to a person that was wrongfully charged for standing up for what is morally right. And I want my grandchildren to know, my future children to know, you know, other tribes, other people that were all there, not just Native people, to know that I didn't go down with the, without a fight. And that I stood behind everything that I believed in to be right and if I were to sign a plea deal all that stuff goes down the drain so you're still facing charges I'm still facing charges. what are those charges a uh, federal civil disorder and a federal use of a fire to commit federal crime okay. so so was that pertaining to that one incident or just you being there no just that whole day oh, the that whole day, day that, okay all that stuff that transpired that day after they they didn't um um, couldn't prove that I terrorized the guy. Mm. They put federal charges on me. Mm. So right now, to this day, I'm facing 15 years for a civil disorder and the use of a fire to commit federal crime. Both charges hadn't been used since back in the late 60s and early 70s when they were doing the Black Liberation Movement and the Vietnam protest. So it's been a big gap from now until then since they use these charges on so, somebody. Right. Um, what might you hope to see here? Is there any future path that might be illuminated here <laughs> or is it just... <clears throat> I want to be honest with you, like, um, maybe, I'm get, maybe I'm here hoping to get some insight on what's, what's happening and how how maybe with like, you I mean, I'm, I've seen some pretty heavy hitters here, you know, you got Sherry Fulton here, and um, she had to deal with a lot of things down in Louisiana. And uh, I'm trying to maybe hopefully get some insight on, on things um, that could possibly help me out in my case. And uh, maybe, maybe I could shed some light on other people's, you know, uh, insights on what they're going through and what it is that they're, um, um, dealing with or wanting to build or, or anything like that, you know, because like right now I moved back to New Mexico and I'm, we're doing a lot of uh, green energy building, uh, where we're doing a lot of solar panels, adobe houses, like, you know, um, just, just all kinds of things that are, you know, are environmental friendly, so. 
Sounds like you're in a nice place, though, to share some <laughs> ideas and, and, and swap some stories, too, oh, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah, I like to think so. So, well, great. Hey, is there anything I didn't ask you that you would like to uh, share or talk about? No, no, I think, I think you asked all the right questions. Well, I really do appreciate you sitting down and, and, and uh, talking. Um, and did you say you were Pueblo, is that? Yes, I'm, uh, I'm Kafshkeme. I'm from the San Felipe Pueblo in New Mexico. Oh, okay. Okay. So, well, thank you so much for sharing and um, welcome to the Convergence. And uh, thank you. Maybe I'll see you around the fire or something. Almost like definitely. <laughs> <laughs> thank you.